Hey there, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in for another exciting lesson about building operating systems and the like. Today we're going to hone the power of the BIOS. I know it sounds exciting, and I don't want to keep you waiting. Let's jump right in. So what is the BIOS, and how is it going to help us? BIOS is an acronym that stands for Basic Input Output System, and it's essentially firmware. So it's built into your computer, uh, it ships right with the computer, you can't really separate the computer from the firmware, and little did we know, it provides handy functions for when we're in 16-bit real mode. So we thought that we were building our programs on completely bare metal and we were on our own to make everything happen. Turns out we actually have the BIOS with tons of functions to help us out for printing characters, reading characters, things like that. It's almost like the C standard library. Well, I don't know if I can make that comparison, but it's pretty helpful. The downside is it's not accessible in protected mode or 32-bit mode. So once we switch over from 16-bit to 32 or 64-bit mode, we can't rely on the BIOS anymore. We're really going to have to find a different way of doing things. But for now, it's great. In order to use the BIOS, we'll have to talk about interrupts. That's when we turn over control to the BIOS, we interrupt our program in order to execute a BIOS command, and this is where we're going to get all the value out of the BIOS. We stop our program and turn over execution of the BIOS. The way that we do this, it's a lot like calling a function if you're programming or scripting, it's just a different way of passing arguments. The first thing you have to do is set your registers, which will be your arguments. Usually AH tells you which function, because there can be more than one sub-function within a single interrupt code. The other registers can hold whatever data is relevant to that function. This includes the lower half of the AX register, AL, as well as CX and DX, and there are probably others that I'm not aware of. It may also utilize the stack. Finally, you call int 0x, whatever number of the interrupt, to actually perform the interrupt, using the registers as they are currently set up. So what are some useful interrupts and examples of how they're used? Uh, my favorite one, and the one that you'll see immediately, is print character. For this one, you move 0x0e into the AH register and put in AL whatever character you would like to print out. Now you can just put the character in quotes and the assembler will substitute it for you, but in this example I used 0x41, which is the ASCII code for a capital A. Once you're done, call int 0x10 which I'm pretty sure all 0x10s are graphics related. To read a character, which will block your program's execution until someone types a key on the keyboard, you put 0x0 into AH and then run interrupt 0x16. The return value for this is stored in the AL register, so if you hit the A button, the character code for A is stored in AL. You can use that value in AL to print the character back out or do anything else you want to do. Keep that in mind for the challenges. A really easy to use interrupt is reboot. All you have to do is call interrupt 0x19 and the system will reboot. I don't think it fully powers off and turns back on and certain memory registers may not be reset properly the way they were when you actually did power on. You might want to read more about it if you're actually going to use it for something, but it's an easy way to just restart your program really quickly. Another helpful command is wait. For this one you just move 0x86 into AH to indicate the wait function. And then CX to DX is your time to wait in microseconds. Microseconds are pretty small, so you need both registers to hold that number. For this example, I converted one second to microseconds, which is one million microseconds, and then I converted that to hex, which is 0xF4240 microseconds. The first half of that goes into CX, 0x000F, and then the second half goes into DX, 0x4240, and if you call int 0x15, you will see execution stop for a second, literally one second, and then come back and continue running your program. Cursor commands will be helpful for the challenges. This is essentially where are you printing your characters to on the teletype screen. So you can move that cursor around before you print, and then when you call the print command, it will print at the cursor's location. This helps you print in the middle of the screen, in the bottom right, in the top left, and it's also how you create text-based GUIs. If you've ever used your BIOS configuration screen, you've probably seen something like this, where an entire menu is formed just with the teletype characters. So enabling the cursor is straightforward, and you really just need to copy this verbatim. Then to move it, you put 0x02 into AH, BH00, and then DH and DL are your column and row respectively. So this example moves it to 5,5, and then you call 0x10, and it moves the cursor there. Now any characters that you print will be at 5,5. 5. 
A little bit more abstract is the switch mode and clear the screen. So again, you'll need this for the challenges. I'm sure there are plenty more modes, but the only two that I'm concerned with are text mode and VGA mode. The one that we've been using all along is text mode, where you have the teletype and the cursor, and it acts as one would expect a terminal to act. VGA mode gives you control of individual pixels, and this is how you would really start to draw a graphical user interface. You just move 0x0 into AH, and then whichever mode into AL. 0x3 for text, 0x13 for VGA. Then call in 0x10. So where am I getting this information? I will admit most of it is from Googling around and saying, how do I do this or that, and reading the Stack Overflow questions. However, there's not always a Stack Overflow answer for every question that I have, and I was having trouble finding the manual for the BIOS. Where is the actual reference material, the book that I can open up and check? The best resource that I've found, and that everyone refers to on all these answers all over the internet, is Ralph Brown's interrupt list. Basically, he has documented every interrupt including what register means what when you're passing arguments in and where the return value is stored after you execute the interrupt. So go to that link, download the first file, the part A zip file, unzip it, and then open interrupt A through dot D with notepad or wordpad and you can read through it and then you can control F and look up certain functions or keywords like you could look up read character or you could look up AH equals number H or uh, the interrupt number or whatever you need to do. One thing to note is I've been using 0x notation to denote hex. He is using the suffix notation where he puts an H at the end of a number. It's the exact same thing. So 0x0 is the same thing as 0H. Now let's jump into our example code. You might want to check it out on GitHub and even copy and paste it if it's easier for you. There's the link to the repository and I'll also leave that link in the description. Let's jump in. Before we get started with this, pop open your VM, get your terminal open, log in as root, whatever you need to do. Then we should probably install Vim. Do this with apt install Vim and it should install. Mine is already done. Vim is a pretty widely used text editor and it comes with most Linux operating systems. Vim is actually VI improved. VI is the program that typically comes with it. It's a little hard to use at first, but if you know the basics, you can get around in Vim. Feel free to also use gedit if you really prefer a GUI tool, but I find Vim to be really useful and quick once you figure out how to use it. Basically, you just type vim file name, in this case our assembly file. Then to start editing the file, you have to go into insert mode. Just press the I key on your keyboard to do that, and it should say insert at the bottom left. Now you can type as if this is notepad or any other text editor. You're good to go. Once you're done typing, press escape to get out of insert mode. Now you can use all kinds of shortcuts like colon and then type a line number and then hit enter. It'll take you to that line. Or you can hit DD to delete a line. There's tons of documentation on shortcuts in Vim and you can even customize it with your own commands. Either way, once you've edited and you pressed escape, you can type the command colon WQ, which means write quit, and this will save the file and exit Vim. That's really all you need to know, how to enter insert mode and how to get out of Vim and save the file. With that said, let's jump into our example program here and go through line by line what everything means. The first line here says bits 16. This isn't a command to the processor. It's actually telling our assembler, NASM, that we're in 16-bit mode. This changes the way it assembles the program. The second command is similar in that it's telling you where this program will be stored in memory. The way a bootloader works is it's placed in the first 512 bytes on a bootable medium. This could be a hard drive, or a CD drive, or even a USB stick. When the system is booting up, the firmware checks all of these devices in the order that you specify. So you can specify CD first, hard drive first, all that stuff. If it ends with the bootloader signature 0xAA55, it's considered valid, and the operating system will try to boot it. Otherwise, it'll go on to the next source. Once it's considered valid, the bootloader will be copied into memory. The most common place to copy that bootloader is memory location 0x7C00. So this org command is just telling the assembler where it is in memory. This way when we move things around, like in this case we move text string into a register, the assembler knows to add 0x7C00 to the memory address within the program. So the address of that hello world string is somewhere between 0 and 512. With the org command, the assembler knows to add 0x7c00 to that 
to get its actual location once the program is up and running in memory. So that's the first two lines there. Then we have the start label, which is good to have whether or not you jump back to it. The first thing we do is print a character. So we move 0x0e into ah, and then we move our text string into si. The source index register is usually used for this kind of thing with string operations. It's going to hold the address of that string. When we say we're moving the address of the string into memory, we're really just moving the address of the first character. We treat it as a string, and then when we reach the null character, the zero byte at the end, we know the string is finished. Then we have the next character label, and we'll see why we're doing the thing with the SI. Remember that AL, the lower side of the AX register, is holding which character we're printing. So we're going to take the address stored in SI and go to that memory location using the brackets, get that value, and move it into AL. Then we call the interrupt to print the character. Next, we're going to increment SI. We're going to add one to SI. Remember that it's just a pointer to a memory location. It's not the actual value that we're changing. Then we compare AL and zero. Are we at the end of the string yet, basically? If it's not zero, we're going to jump back up to next character. Then we do it all again. If you'll notice towards the bottom, where we're defining hello world, we end with a zero byte. This way we know when we're finished printing the string. Also keep in mind that the zero byte is different from the zero ASCII character, which is why it doesn't print hello world zero. Once we reach the end of the string, program flow will continue past that jump not equal next character to jump dollar sign. Jump dollar sign means jump to this memory location. So it's actually just going to sit there and do this over and over and over and it hangs and does nothing. The last two lines are pretty important too. Without them, this wouldn't be a bootloader. The times 510 line fills the remainder of our bytes available for this 512 byte bootloader with zeros. But notice it didn't go all the way to 512 because we need those last two for the bootloader signature. For this, we have the last line, which is declare word 0xAA55. All that's doing is just putting AA55 right at the end of our program. This way the firmware knows that this is a valid bootloader. When people talk about making a bootable USB or a bootable CD, this is what has to be there to make it happen. So that's about it for this program. As a refresher, we can assemble this program with NASM and run it using QEMU system, and we will see that our program is executed. Take a second now to edit the example program in some way. Since this is so simple, the only way I really see of tweaking this is to change the hello world string. I've added a two to the end of the string just for fun. While this isn't a course on assembly, I thought it would be helpful to review jumps and how they work. This will be essential for any kind of if-else logic that you have when working on the challenges or really doing anything with assembly. The first thing you'll need is labels, which you can just write a label name and put a colon, and your assembler will take care of the rest. As far as determining which memory location to jump to and whatnot, it's all taken care of. The next one is the compare directive, which I initially, when I first learned about it, really had no idea what it did. It's simple though, all you have to do is call this between two things that you would like to compare. In this example, I'm comparing AX and the literal number zero. Now that doesn't do much on its own, but it sets up flags in the CPU so that you can use jump commands directly after. The way that you do it is you use the compare command and then the line immediately following has to be a jump command of some sort to take advantage. In this example, we use jump equal start label. So if AX is equal to zero, then it will jump to start label. Otherwise it won't do anything and it'll just continue to the next line. There are a whole bunch of available jump types, but they're really pretty simple. It's the same operators you would have available to you in a programming language for greater than, less than, equal to, all that kind of stuff. Just instead of using equals equals or greater than signs, we're using these commands along with a comparison command right before them. So JE is jump if equal, JNE is jump not equal, JL is jump if it's less, JLE, jump less than or equal, JG, jump greater, JGE, jump greater than or equal. Finally, JMP is unconditional jump. This doesn't take into command anything, including the CMP command. It just goes. No matter what, it's going to jump to where you tell it. A note for these jump commands is that they're reading left to right for the comparison command right before them. In the above example, click, we compare AX to 0x0. So AX is on the left and 0x0 is on the right. So if you're using JL, jump if less, AX would be on the left if you were to write it out and 0x0 would be on the right. So you're saying AX is less than 0. 
If that's true, then it will jump. If it's not true, then it won't. Now you're not quite done yet. I have some challenges for you to try out and we'll go over them in the next lesson and have some fun with the BIOS. So now is where the fun begins. Get ready. The first thing I want you to try to do is read a character and then print it and loop on those two commands forever. If you do it right, you should be able to type on your keyboard when your new operating system is running and actually see these keys coming up on the screen. One way to make that slightly more complicated is 1-2, where if you read an enter character, reboot the system. So you can type, you can type, you can type, and then when you hit enter, it reboots. You'll need to create logic using conditional jumps to make that happen. The next one I have for you is to clear the screen. We went over the different modes, and that's a hint for you. Go check out the modes. That should tell you how to clear the screen. Make sure you go for text mode, by the way because the second part of this challenge is to write something in the middle of the now empty screen that you just cleared. The third program I want you to try to make is a switch to VGA mode and then filling the screen with a color of your choice. To make it a little bit harder, add in a wait function for 1 30th of a second or something like that to actually allow you to appreciate the pixel by pixel fill that you're doing. I did include a BIOS quick reference here. It has a table of all of the interrupts we've discussed so far with all the information you need to use them in these challenges. And you'll notice that I did add one at the very bottom that I forgot to include earlier, which is fill VGA pixel. You'll need this for challenge three. Once you've switched to VGA, it should be as simple as filling in those values and coloring it in. That's all I had for this lesson. Thanks for listening and good luck with the challenges. See you for the next one.